oftentimes in EMA, in the EMA community, people shy away from 133 because it has this awkward uh, artwork that is really hard to decode and to make sense of. And uh, I've, I've often heard people who uh, looked at 133, oh no, come on, leave me alone with 133, I just cannot make sense of it. So um, this lecture will be about does that fighting system tie in with other systems? And then um, in the second part of the lecture, we're going to look at how we can decode the illustration in 133 because maybe, because all of us are used to look at photographs, maybe we're missing something in regards to 13th and 14th century artwork. All right, and so uh, if you could just go to the next page, please. Where's your ah, There he is. Yeah, so here you can see uh, 133, and there's a sword bind up there that's a random plate from Giganti. And uh, this we can easily understand. We can perfectly see that the fencer on the right has won the bind. He's on top, he's controlling the fight as he makes the hit. Interestingly, in 133, as well as in many other traditions, many other combat um, sources, it says that long point is the heart of the art. 133, which uh, was probably made in 1320, in fact, my friend Cornelius is challenging that, and um, he's an expert on manuscripts, and uh, he thinks there's evidence that uh, despite the dress that we see in 133, it may, may actually be more like 1350, but he'll come out with uh, his hypothesis and his evidence for that at a later point. So. Um, um, it is the first book that actually mentions Long Point as being the heart of the art. And then everybody who's doing Lichtenauer knows that, and of course the rapier is all about the point. Now, uh, if we look at that plate, though, it just doesn't look anything like Long Point. So the uh, fencer here, he is the one who controls the bind, but see where his sword is pointing to the knee? That's actually not uh, what we consider um, Long Point when we speak of long point. Okay, so does 133 be like, uh, is that just an outlier? Does it have any, is there any reference that can embed that in a uh, larger context? Okay. <clears throat> now here's uh, a plate from, uh, from a source which is not about sword fighting, but it does have a lot of fighting uh, sequences. And we see a melee and there are people, uh, there's one guy with a butler and then there's a guy, uh, most of them have heater shields. So this is a military encounter here, it's not dueling at all. But if you go to the, uh, to the next um, page, if we compare the artwork of that figure up there and then if you just look at the feet and compare it to down here, that looks very, very similar. Plus, what, uh, what is also evident is that uh, in, the, in the top plate, we have the same kind of awkward depiction of weapons where you see the weapon square on. Like that guy who parries, I think he parries a spear or something, you cannot see in that, uh, um, in that crop version, but he's lifting um, the shield and it looks like it's turned sideways for us modern viewers. Of course, that's pretty useless to block anything with a, um, to cover yourself with the side of the buckler. So we do, it seems like there are uh, conventions at work here which we have to decode. Now, if we go um, to the next page uh, and illuminate the guy on the right, and it's interesting to note that here, if you look at the foot position, this source, which predates 133 by some uh, two, maybe three generations at least, uh, they do something that 133 seems to shy away from. Because uh, if you look at his rear leg, the toes are turned away from the viewer. You don't ever see that in 133. But um, the artwork in that um, source and the, the miniatures seems to have even more, even more uh, instruments uh, to show the physical side of things. So they do show a uh, foot that is turned away from the viewer. Now, if we compare that to a later tradition, like everybody, everybody knows uh, Talhofer. <coughs> 
and Tallhofer, uh, that's probably the nicest and most graceful illustrations uh, in the medieval German Fechtbücher that there is. And the uh, next uh, image where we highlight that uh, figure down there. Well, admittedly, he's uh, in a pretty bad position right now, but if we, just look <laughs> if we just look at his foot position and compare it to the foot position up there, and uh, considering that this is uh, late or mid 50, 15th century, while this is uh, late 13th century, it looks very akin, doesn't it? Because up there we can tell which uh, le uh, leg is in the lead, and it's exactly what we see down there. So um, here we have a source that predates 133. There we have a source that is a later source. So are there more overlaps when we look at 133 in comparison to uh, Talhofer for that end? So uh, maybe if we see something like that in perfect profile in 133, uh, maybe that doesn't mean that we see a person in profile on the balls of their foot balancing like this and doing something. Maybe it's more something like uh, what we see in Talhofer, only because uh, it has a uh, poorer sense of uh, naturalistic de depiction. Um, we get a wrong idea of what is shown in 133 here. So let's have a look at another plate then. Um, so what about this? Uh, this is just a suggestion um, to try to link 133 to later images which we can read much better. Uh, up there we see a person who's actually uh, doing a way more complex step than is suggested down here, but it could be that down there it's just flattened out and in fact it's supposed to show something like we see in Talhofer up there where he's actually, uh, one foot is turning to the side. Okay, next uh, image. Um, and interestingly, this kind of stepping that we see in Talhofer is already shown in Gothic art, because up there it's pretty clear, this is a var variant of uh, Fifth Ward, but it comes from a different source than 133, and uh, this is a lot more naturalistic in terms of the angulation of the feet, and that cre clearly looks like um, cross-stepping, or at least at a, uh, as, a, as a step where the feet are turned outwards, other than um, it appears to be the case in 133. So again, maybe that is just a more flat perspective, a more flat illustration than this one, which predates 133, at least by one generation, or according to my friend Cornelius, by two generations. And uh, if we look at another uh, depiction that is uh, more or less contemporary to 133, again, here you can clearly see uh, the, this foot, um, the front foot, that is apparently the left leg, and uh, it does look, it does, it does very much looks like he's taking a cross step, doesn't it? Okay, so um, next page. <coughs> the cool thing about uh, the time of Talhofer is that we don't not we uh, do not only have his place, but we also have um, sculptures, statues of dancers. This is a Morris dancer. It's a statue made by an artist, a very gifted artist, uh, Erasmus Grasser, in the late 15th century. So uh, admittedly, it's not a sword fighter. This is a dancer. But it's quite interesting that this looks very familiar, doesn't it? And uh, the great thing, so you see uh, exactly that um, he's about to uh, do a four-foot strike, and also his toes are turned outwards. We also see this folded posture where the hip is taken back almost as if he's sitting down. And, and he's dancing, he's not fencing. However, in Talhofer, it looks very much like dancing too. And um, there are a number of these statues, and uh, so far they have not been given much consideration mm -hmm. for uh, reconstructing swordsmanship. But I uh, recommend uh, taking a closer look at them. There are dozens of them. Another one that we will see now, the top one, um, is also made by Erasmus Grasser, and it's in the old town hall in Munich. And um, I found a little porcelain statuette that was uh, based, that is based on that original statue up there. And now if we look at these two pictures here, so uh, if we look at the, the uh, figure at the sculpture in profile and compare it to 133, it looks strikingly, strikingly similar, doesn't it? 
But the cool thing about uh, the three-dimensional object is that we can just turn it and take a look at it from the front. And now you see this kind of stepping. Okay, that's really interesting. So um, just by comparing artwork and uh, looking at the various traditions and what they uh, did and what they did not uh, do, like um, flattening out perspectives, perspective versus naturalistic depiction, um, it could well be possible that what we see in 133 is in fact a very elaborate posture like the one that we see in this statue. And this kind of stepping where the, where the knees are turned outwards, you're actually, uh, what, you do, what you do is uh, you bring the knees outward uh, and um, the toes are pointing to one side. This is something which gives you really good grounding and stabilizes your stance if you sit down. And the sitting down uh, leads to this forward lean and that takes away the lower openings while you are fencing up here. It works really, really well as we have uh, experimented uh, with and found out. And um, if you go to the next page, this kind of stepping is still in existence in the 20th century. So here you see Shirley Temple doing a curtsy. So we still have thing like, things like that in Belay. So a tradition of uh, a, a culture of motion that we see in uh, Talhofer in the 15th century and that uh, appears to also have been in use even before 133 has an uh, ongoing tradition up until the 20th century or yet up uh, on today. So when did it start? If we take a look at the next one. So here we have flows. This is a compilation, so it's not an actual manuscript page. It's a compilation of various uh, really nice and lively drawings. Like up there, you see a dancer. She's clearly uh, cross-stepping, or at least she's uh, <coughs> stepping with the toes turned outwards. And then uh, here's, uh, here's an angel that is throwing a spear. You've seen a profile. This foot looks a bit like it's tilting, like it's tilting outwards, but uh, all in all, the position is not too uh, unfamiliar. It does look a little bit like 133. Up there, this guy is clearly using that kind of step. And then, uh, and even uh, the, uh, the guys that give Jesus a hard time, they do it too, or uh, peasants on the field, or this retinue of the, uh, of the king down here. And uh, even though these look very Renaissance, they were made in 820. So here we're looking at the at Carolingian times. This is artwork, Frankish artwork. So that's the Viking age. So that suggests that um, we are looking at a motion, a culture of motion that has been in existence in Europe at least for centuries, right? Um, and uh, I think there is good evidence that 133, in fact, is embedded in that tradition. Now. Um, to give more evidence to uh, the idea that flattening, that 133 is just simply flattened out perspective, uh, I will show you, yeah, see, so if we look at that again here, this is naturalistic uh, depiction, and here maybe we are, given that uh, this is embedded in the tradition that I'm talking about, maybe we're missing some details here, maybe uh, we cannot encode it correctly, even though this overbind, which um, we used to do exactly like, uh, as seen in this image, overbinding an opposing sword by pressing it down with a point being completely uh, um, offline, not pointing at the target, which is the head at all. Maybe we were missing how to actually read these illustrations all the time. So. My friend Ingo, a fellow fencer of mine, who also is an archaeologist, said, well, wait a second, there's actually a book about technical illustration in uh, the 13th and 14th century. And uh, you probably have seen the next image before, which shows uh, a couple, a nobleman and a lady, and they're playing chess. And um, if that was a photo, you would not get any idea of the state of play on the board. So. Gothic illustration gives you that additional information by simply turning the board towards you. And um, in, if you look at it as uh, being in a tradition of technical illustration, then uh, it's not the inability to show naturalistic, uh, showing things in a naturalistic way, but there is a deeper meaning to it and you get more than one perspective. 
Oh, by the way, there's also a social perspective that not of much interest for us right now, but uh, interestingly, these figures down here, they're apparently way smaller, and uh, you would think like, oh God, those poor artists in the Middle Ages, they simply had no sense of uh, perspective at all. But that is a social perspective, that's another thing. Um, uh, these musicians, they are not as of important a part of that illustration as are uh, the noble people up here. By the way, we still do have this kind of illustrations these days. If you just think about uh, posters for movies, where you would have the hero being super large, and then there's a sequence from the movie uh, that is framing the hero or the heroine. So we still have that. So we actually do use it even today. Now, um, here comes a technical illustration showing a mill. And um, as you can see, uh, this is totally not, nat nat uh, this is not naturalistic at all, um, because we see it from more than one perspective at once. If you, wanted to, if you wanted to do that today, to make a technical illustration to explain to somebody how a mill actually works, <coughs> you would use a couple of photos. You would shoot it from various angles. Now, uh, they would probably, just guessing, uh, think like, oh, what a poor approach. You need more than one, uh, you need more than one image, you poor bastards. Well, we can do it in one. So we just also remember that resources for creating illustration were scarce and it was very expensive. So uh, using that approach that you show more than one perspective and one in the same image does make sense. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, uh, keeping this in the back of our minds and looking at 133 anew, um, here we have a situation where there is a uh, very classic situation in 133, where one fencer is overbinding the other fencer. Now, um, if this is uh, supposed to be a long pointy situation with that blade actually menacing him, uh, but uh, to show that uh, he is controlling the bind by showing his sword being unobscured to the viewer, we think that is in fact, uh, that is in fact one of the um, important bits to consider when you look at 133. The sword that is turned, that is closer to the viewer, so the sword that is on top is the sword that it controls the bind. So if we just fold this up a little bit, then uh, we can do an overbind in this fashion, yeah, where the one who is overbinding the opposing blade can actually menace the uh, can menace the face of his opponent, but he's still in control of the weapon. However, if indeed it is a, um, if indeed it is important for the understanding of the reader of the medieval book to see the superior sword unobscured by the one that crosses it, then for the illustrator you would have to fold that down, and then you end up with this, because that if if, he, if the illustrator would. Uh, just simply draw this situation from this perspective, then um, readers would misunderstand that it's actually this blade that is superior because it's the one that is closer to the viewer. Let's have a look at another example. Okay, so uh, just now, this person was overbinding his opponent who did, uh, who basically did a cavazione, a uh, mutatio gladii, as it is called in 133. And so he is superior now, all right? Even with the photo, it would be hard to tell at first glance who is superior, who is lying on top of the opposing sword, who's controlling the central space. We would have to shoot this from various angles. We would have to stand uh, behind this person, taking a photo from this perspective so what, that we see what he sees, so that we know, okay, I understand, he is in fact superior because he's overbinding, okay? And this is probably exactly what we see down here. Because if, uh, if uh, I was the illustrator and told those guys, hey guys, could you just fold it down so I see the essential bit too? And if you go to the next image. So if you fold this down, if you even fold it further down, you end up with exactly that. So uh, here's the position after the... So he's fallen on the sword and shield. Uh, he was being overbound. Bound. He did a cavazione, and he's on top. This is, uh, this, is, um, this is the actual situation, but for you to see the essentials, everything's folded down, okay? 
But that, of course, means that the point is uh, completely taken offline if we look at uh, this illustration, because folding down means that I'm no longer in the illustration threatening the opponent's head, all right? But the essential bit is that, uh, that uh, we see who is on top. Because the book says uh, long point is the heart of the art, and it also says every action of the sword has to find its conclusion in long point. So this, is be, this information you have, uh, already have gotten anyway. So now in the play you get, other, uh, you get additional information which is important for you to do it correctly. Okay, so uh, here this is the uh, same thing. So here we have a situation where uh, after an overbind uh, that uh, fighter has uh, moved in. So he was in a half shield, he was uh, overbinding. He found that it's safe to get closer. He moved in closer and he was menacing the opponent's uh, face and he could just thrust him in the face if he does not raise the buckler. If he raises the buckler, he takes the buckler with his own a shield strike and then hits him in the head. And you can see it looks a bit messy in the photo because uh, it's actually a pretty clever move because uh, this sword is caught in this little uh, shall we call it a cavity, this, this little flat V-shaped uh, part of the shield, uh, but it's, it's uh, sticking out like so. So if you make a drawing of that, it looks like his uh, point is still threatening the guy who's doing the shield strike, which in fact is not the case because it's turned laterally, and thus it is folded down here, and um, the bug, this buckler is on top, so it's the one that is unobscured by the opposing buckler. So we do see the same system at work, even with the shield strike. All right, now, um, how does that explain that when we look at one of the most hotly debated techniques in 133, namely the falling under the sword and shield, how does that explain that uh, both these illustrations, the one on top as well as the one below, have exactly the sa same text to go with it, namely, which means when half shield is adopted, fall under the sword as well as under the shield. It says the same up here, it's a bit blurry, so you can't really tell, but it's, it has exactly the same uh, caption to go with that one. And apparently, even though this is flipped around, the position of the shield here is totally different. This shield is way lower than the shield of this person who's supposed to have fallen under the sword. Here, the shield is much higher. The, the, the bind is not in the same spot anymore. Like here, he's binding with a uh, weak of his sword. Here, he's binding with the middle of the sword. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of strange. Um, however, we already have a clue. Um, because we were told, or I was telling you, <coughs> that um, the sword that is superior, the sword that actually uh, controls the bind, is the one that is closer to the viewer. Okay? So, um, we assume that uh, in this image here, because it's the half shield uh, sword that is closer to the viewer, that's the one that is about to control the situation. Now, uh, here, this image flipped around. I have fallen under sword and shield, so because I have to deal, I have to deal with the opposing blade, and um, as I make contact, I will not be superior. I will be inferior at that moment. Um, however, What's the whole point of falling under the sword and shield in the first place? Because it's useless to have an action, a fencing action, which can't not possibly win you the fight. Right? All these years we were not giving all too much consideration to uh, falling under the sword and shield. It was just like the start of the hallmark place in 133. But what does it actually do? Now, um, if we think uh, that if the half shielder does not manage to do a proper overbind in time, but instead the one who has fallen <coughs> under sword and shield manages to bring his sword as he raises his hand from a low position to a higher position and uh, moves to the side, brings his sword on top, then that would win the one who's inferior the superior bind. So let's look at the next plate. All right, so this is exactly what I suggested uh, just now. Now these are not stage photos, these are screenshots from videos. So if that was a stage photo, I would have to adopt a less straight posture here, but that's not so important at the moment. What's more important is that here we have a shield that is rather low, or that what is important is that the hands are low. Now if I sidestep, if I outflank the opponent, if I manage to do that and raise my sword, I will be on top and I will be the one 
man is seeing his face, and uh, if um, we look at the next image, this could be exactly what we see in the alternative depiction of falling under the sword and shield. This is a falling under the shield where the one who came from first world actually managed to win the fight, and uh, this is explained to us by his sword being unobscured uh, by the one that it crosses, that the, the sword that is closer to the viewer is the sword that is superior, and uh, thus we kind of see a somewhat later stage of falling under the sword and shield, but it's basically one technique, it's uh, falling under the sword and shield, gaining the bind, and then stepping in and thrusting it. Okay, so, um, that doesn't look that unfamiliar to what uh, we see in later treatises anymore. And uh, if this suggestion on how to read 133 with different eyes makes sense to you, then uh, this interpretation is not, uh, it's, <coughs> a it's a legitimate one. And then you can see it actually does tie in nicely with later rapier illustrations and so I guess that we are looking at a tradition when we're looking at uh, the more elaborate Fechtbücher of the Renaissance or the late Middle Ages. This is only the conclusion of a tradition that dates back uh, ages and ages, probably way into the early Middle Ages and uh, if you ask me, I think it probably goes down to the Bronze Age and even before. Okay, so that was the end uh, of my presentation. Do you have any questions? Is there a particular plate you want to see again? Then, yeah, Michael. Uh, um, I love the tip of great. I really like this. It's not the kind of thing I'm waiting for. But uh, I was reminded, and certainly the social perspective, of all those nice uh, lower libarities of uh, Pharaoh cutting off a whole bunch of enemy heads at one time. The great big Pharaoh. A sword in one hand, and then he's lifting them up, and he's going to go. <laughs> and so that social perspective is as old as we can go. In, oh yeah. In, oh yeah. In, in hierarchical. Society. Absolutely. I think I think uh, the idea to making um, art to represent nature that's fairly young, in fact. Yeah. It's yeah. It is. There's a whole literature effect on, on yeah. that. But, yeah. Um, and you see that like in some parts of Roman art. Yeah, and you see that. Yeah, and you see that in, in, so in Christian art all the time. For yeah. representation, and what I love about what you've done here is you've shown there's a very specific use for uh, this kind of representation. It, it should relate. You should relate it to technical drawing. Yeah. And, and not to the representation. Uh, to a naturalistic, naturalistic uh, representation, representation, which we know it is not, because there's no fencing <coughs> where you always exclusively see uh, either the front or the inside of the buckler or uh, the sword square on all the time. Fencing is about all these minute motions where uh, you change the angulation of the alignment of the plate. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know well, I'm happy if it makes sense to you. So, uh, so the one thing I want to sort of speculation about is, is uh, I have a feeling that I've seen it, but I'm not sure of that kind of representation on multi-planes of various objects to illustrate what's important inside the people. Mm -hmm. so Okay, well, if, you, if ever you find it, just email uh, it to me. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, Leonard? Yes. Um, in your training, one of your training videos, you make reference to the fact that when, in a very short period, the swords got longer and your posture changed. Uh, so it, the construction of the sword, but could you clarify that for me? This, Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure I know which uh, video you are referring to, but... Um, you did, you know, you, yeah. you said, yes, the uh, longer swords... <coughs> yes, um, so while I'm convinced that uh, there is universal uh, martial arts principles, and because anatomy and physics doesn't change, uh, there are, they, they are 
the base for all martial arts, including fencing. However, of course, anything that is altered also alters the application. Like uh, we were talking this morning about um, how these days we enter measure. It was in my class yesterday. So if I just look at, uh, say, uh, overbinding, so I'm coming from half shield and, um, and assuming he's not doing anything, I'm advised to uh, hit him in the head. Now, uh, I, these days, I never get so close that I can hit him with my in initial step because I want to be safe while I'm trying to control the bind. So let's say, let's so, say uh, he has fallen under sword and shield. I do an overbind and I prepare my next step without moving my frame, which is my body, to not give away that I'm actually closer than he thinks. And then when I feel it's safe, I just shift in and I uh, thrust him in the face, or if he lifts his buckler, I shield strike and uh, hit him with the sword. Now, uh, subdividing, entering into two measures becomes even more complex as blades become longer. As I was told yesterday by some of the rapier wrists that they have a lot more minute divisions of uh, distances, which makes sense because as you have to bridge a longer distance, then uh, you have to be aware that that takes more time, so this time has to be planned very, very carefully. Uh, so the length of uh, swords has uh, um, importance in that, re uh, in that respect. And then the other thing is, which uh, is important to consider, everybody of you knows that, if, uh, that I have my maximum reach at shoulder level, and because the arm is attached to the shoulder, the point will move on a, uh, on, on, a, on a circle segment as I lower my arm, which means that I lose reach if I go for a lower, t uh, for a lower target. The lower my hand, the less reach. Now, if I want to thrust somebody in the thigh with a sword, uh, with, the, with the sword, I have to lower my sword to here. If, in contrast, I have a spear and I'm like uh, this far away, I have only have to lower, uh, uh, assuming this is a spear that is some two and a half meters, I only have to lower it to here, okay? So uh, even though it's still true that I have less reach as I lower my arm, um, I don't lose as much reach by lowering the arm as I would if I use the sword. So uh, it does make a difference uh, how long a blade actually is. Thank you. That, you know, and that's, I wanted to make sure I yeah. understood from okay. the video what was actually said. I mean, I didn't. Yeah, also, uh, it's good that you mentioned the swords because um, here we are looking at uh, uh, rapiers which usually have very, very thin blades. As opposed, this is actually quite a thin blade too. Um, a lot of the swords from the era when 133 was used uh, had blades that look more like the one that Cornelius is using here. Um, they provide you with a lever that you don't have with the uh, rapier because uh, if there is a bind and I just turn my sword uh, into either direction, even when keeping the point online, I get a lever by the width of the sword. So I can actually set aside an opposing blade, which uh, the narrower the blade comes, the less a lever that actually is. Right? So the design of the sword should also be considered. Plus. Um, those swords, uh, the sword that uh, Cornelius is using here is a very typical medieval uh, sword with a disc pommel with chamfered edges and it's in fact a replica of a sword that I examined in Lübeck and it's actually very top heavy. It's really, really top heavy. But um, uh, in blade fencing, in fencing with vines, that's a great help because you, no, you don't, the, the sword does a lot of jobs for you in the bind, so in fact you have to be so subtle that you do not give too much of a pressure signal to the opposing party. And then the other thing is, and this is um, <coughs> something that which I will show in my demo tomorrow when we uh, talk about heater shields and uh, shield combat in general, the way that we strike these days with these swords, we hardly ever do any direct blows, so say from the shoulder, going straight uh, into the target, something like that, we don't do that because there's a shield. Yeah, so the most natural strike that there is, is of course the one that you would pick up a shield against to prevent to be hit. So you have to come up with a more elaborate way of striking people because it's totally pointless striking the shield inside. Makes sense, right? That's what the shield is there uh, for in the first place. So you have to get to the unshielded side and the way to do that is uh, using um, a, a Twerhau, um, 
more or less horizontal blow to either side, but uh, the best one is if uh, you strike, so here's the shielded side of my opponent, so I want to strike there. And the strikes that we use in 133 come from exactly that uh, tra uh, trajectory. So you lift your hand, and it's the sword, it's the sword's weight that gives it so much power. It's super counterintuitive, because the fist must not go towards the target, because if the fist goes to the target, this it's just leaning on the target. In order to get a good strike, it has to move around its natural pivot points. So I just simply lift it, and it's the weight of the sword that's being accelerated by the hand that actually does the hit. And it looks like it only is a flick from the wrist. It's super powerful. I, uh, ever since we figured out that hit, that this blow, how to do a Tverhau uh, correctly, I completely understand all these fines of skulls from the early Middle Ages when it was all shield fighting, where you see uh, strikes to the back of the head or strikes uh, almost slicing off the top of the skull in more or less a horizontal um, orientation or sometimes slightly fr uh, coming from above. Um, there was recently an examination of a skeleton, a victim that was killed by a sword in the 6th century. And the archaeologists, not having any idea about sword fighting, they uh, tried to figure out the angulation of the blade. And they said it must have been four blows, two from the right and two from the left. And they must have come, at, uh, they must have come slightly from above. And um, the, the guy apparently tried to uh, and try to uh, uh, raise his hands uh, and then <coughs> his fingers got cut off and uh, with the first two, so the first two blows uh, took off his fingers and his hands and then the uh, one blow struck his jaw, taking off part of the jaw and then finally uh, the last hit, well, well, I don't know, I assume it was the last one, but the most fatal one actually cut into his skull and almost completely took off uh, the um, top of the skull. <coughs> And uh, early medieval blades are very, very thin, looking at them in profile, so they're superb cutters. And uh, to me, when they said, like, okay, that was four blows coming at an angle, slightly from the bottom, I thought, yeah, well, of course, because uh, this is how he, was, how he was attacked. Somebody was pursuing him with, uh, with this kind of Sturzau, and as you see, as it strikes, it comes slightly from above. And then the most natural uh, follow-up uh, blow is to go to the other side. And then you just uh, perfectly set up for striking another one while you are pursuing him. That's probably how he got killed. And this has a lot of, uh, this, um, has a lot of power and uh, it's the top-heavy swords of the era that work really, really well with this kind of blow. Anything else that you want to know? Well, you can grab me any time. I'll be out there in the green uh, next to the house, so um, next to Taylor Hall. So you can come any time if you want to know anything. Uh, also, if you want to watch uh, the plates again, uh, I'll have my laptop with me. So you're most welcome to refer to any, if you need any, um, any reference to the actual plates. Just get in touch and just grab me. Well, thank you very much for, if, the, if you have no more questions, thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure.